the TAS podcast with Ian Hall and Martin Bradley, discussing the biggest subjects, the hottest topics, and asking the questions you want answered. The Average Scientist, making science accessible for everyone. Okay, welcome to episode two of the TAS podcast. Uh, I'm Ian Hall and I'm joined as ever by my uh, co-host with the dulcet Lancastrian tones, Martin Bradley. Mark, welcome back. Thanks for joining us once again on uh, the subject of black holes. Yeah, yep. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you are, as always, very welcome. And Mark, as you'll remember from the first episode, it has since been deemed the voice of the people, which um, I've quite enjoyed calling him in the <laughs> previous two weeks. So uh, I think we'll carry that trend on. And we're joined, uh, we're joined on this episode as well by Elsie Dennis. So welcome, Elsie. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> you are very welcome. And um, I'm sure for those people who look at average scientist content on a regular basis you might know a little bit about Elsie already so she is our junior presenter um, and she's currently in secondary school so uh, welcome Elsie thanks very much for joining us today and this is your pet subject isn't it you love black holes you love talking about this you love thinking about like this and this is actually something that you want to perhaps go on and study uh yeah definitely <laughs> so we've got lots to talk about today um and there's like there's so many different things that we could cover on the subject of black holes. But I think it's probably worth kicking it off by just explaining what a black hole is and how they're made. So I'll, I'll kick that process off um, if, you, if you guys like and we'll go from there and see, see where the conversation takes us. So black holes are a region of space where gravity has raged out of control and has collapsed in on itself to become so dense that not even light can escape from that particular part so hence we see them as black so um, a black hole is not a hole in the traditional sense that we would think of a hole in the ground or a hole in a wall or something like that it's still spherical gravity um Gravity favours spherical shapes, crushing things at the surface of that object towards the common centre, and a black hole is no different. So I suppose the first thing that we could try and wrap our heads around here is that a black hole is not a two-dimensional object, or not even really a three-dimensional object, it's a four-dimensional object. So it's a spherical hole with three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension. So what do you guys make of that? That, that's a hard <laughs> that's my head is blown already <laughs> <laughs> that's quite hard from the off isn't it it is really and I, and I think w the the difficulty I have in understanding black holes um, is when we did a couple of graphics for this for the presentation it's trying to represent uh, a, a sphere with no light which instantly looks like a 2D object there's nothing you can really do about that um and when you typically, I suppose, look at there's, there's a famous image. I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's a picture of a black hole, and it shows sort of a glowing outline around it of light. Yeah. And then sort of going around the the perimeter, but then there's another one going around the other perimeter on a different axis. Yeah. Oh. But it's and what I can't wrap my head around with that is if you take that image of a black hole. And you can see that there's light going around the perimeter this way. So that, that doesn't make sense to anybody listening on, 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 on the podcast. <laughs> and it's just going around the perimeter as, as you look at it, yeah? And then around the, the diameter um, from front to back, really, I would expect that that light would be all around it if it's in that particular point there. Yeah, it's a, it's a does good... That make, does that make sense? It does make sense, yeah. No, it's, it's really good. And I think... Um, what, I suppose what you're describing there is almost like a, a hoop shape, isn't it? Where you've got a flat hoop on the bottom and then another hoop stood at 90 degrees kind of in the centre of the other one. So that's, <clears throat> yeah, typically the way that um, black holes are depicted when we see them drawn. Uh, and, and I think that is a, a an attempt uh, representing exactly what you're seeing there because you, you're saying actually very correctly that when we try to draw or represent a black hole, 
it's a sphere, but it's a sphere that has no light. So we can't place any shadows on it anywhere to depict it as spherical. So we have to draw these um, rings or these this area of hot plasma as it is around the <clears throat> event horizon of the black hole to represent the shape of it. And it is very difficult, isn't it? I mean, there was, a li- there was some research done by Stephen Hawking in the 70s, actually, that, um, that sort of really honed in on this area and, and that <clears throat> black holes aren't actually um, infinite absorbers. So when we, when we try to um, depict a black hole and we have that problem, he had that problem too, thinking about it. And um, <clears throat> he he theorised, which was since proven um, obviously correct, that, that black holes <clears throat> excuse me, aren't um, an infinite absorber. They're what we would call um, they were what we would call a black body. So I think you probably understand that from graphics purposes. So a black body is something that doesn't infinitely absorb light and energy but it absorbs a percentage of light and energy that isn't quite 100%. And he he sort of famously said black holes aren't as black as you think. And uh, he he went on to do some more work, which I suppose we'll cover later on for that. But that was kind of his take on it, that, um, you know, black holes perhaps weren't as quite as black as we think, and they shine a bit. And uh, Elsie and I actually have um, been marvelling at a Netflix documentary uh, quite recently. Uh, I've watched it a couple of times now, and uh, I think Elsie's watched it at least once. And it's called. It's on Netflix. If anybody wants to, um, if anybody wants to watch it, and I don't know if you've seen this, Mark. If you haven't, it'll be a good thing to um, to, to have a look at yourself. And it's called uh, Black Holes: The Edge of All We Know. I think that's the title. Is it, Elsie? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. So this is um, it's kind of like a two part um, documentary or two stories unfolding within the same documentary. And uh, one half is looking at the guys that operated something called the Event Horizon Telescope, which was the telescope that first photographed a black hole. And the second half of the documentary, which is kind of a story that's spinning along at the same time, is the last piece of research that Stephen Hawking did with his team, um, which was around something called the soft hair and entropy of a black hole. Oh, I've seen it. Have you seen it? I've seen it. Yes, yes, I have. It's the, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because it showed, and that, that, again, it goes back to that really strange phenomenon I was talking about. There were the picture of the black hole that they actually showed showed the halo of plasma around the perimeter of the hole. And I still can't wrap my head around why it's not just a ball of light if it's all, if it's a 3D, <laughs> not a 3D, but a 4D spherical object. It's weird. It's just weird. It is It is an extremely difficult thing to think about. And I think when um, I've been doing the task talks and things, we've got some bits of content that just focus very briefly on black holes. And it's incredibly difficult for anybody to describe and even more difficult, I think, for people that haven't, looked at the phenomena scientifically to try and wrap your head around all of these different concepts at once because it is just very very bizarre they are incredibly weird objects and whilst our understanding of black holes has improved enormously um, over the past few years we still are very much at the at the in the infancy of the journey in understanding the physics behind them. And there are some people, of course, that have done some great work, Stephen Hawking being a a huge contributor into that area uh, in understanding both what black holes are, how they work, how they're formed. I mean, I suppose we should probably just talk for for just a moment about, because there are some different types as well. So I don't know whether you guys know this, but there are some, there there are three types that we certainly know about and one type that we've theorized might exist. So the first the first type of black hole is called a stellar mass black hole. And that is really exactly what it sounds like. So it's a it's a black hole which is formed by the collapse of a star, typically like our sun, but quite a bit bigger. So um, if if a star collapses and it's not, you know, it's not quite as, as large um, as is needed for a black hole, it probably collapses into something like a neutron star, which is a really, really dense object. It's kind of like the stage before a black hole, if you like. But once you get a star that's roughly probably 20 times the mass of the sun or something like that, once those stars die and they collapse, um, the, uh, they're, just not, they're just not strong enough to su- support the collapse. And that, as that material collapses, 
sort of inwards and inwards and inwards with um, growing pressure and um, growing gravitational force while simultaneously blasting material out in a huge supernova explosion. That's how a black hole, a stellar mass black hole is formed. So that's, that's kind of, um, you know, sort of black hole number one, if you like. And then you've got um, something that's a sort of an, like an intermediate mass black hole. Uh, and that those are pr probably formed, uh, we probably think that those are probably formed by just stellar mass black holes merging. So black holes merge all the time um, as they kind of wander around the universe and meet each other. They orbit around one another in a you know, frenetic dance for sometimes hundreds of thousands, millions of years before they eventually um, sort of coagulate together and form a larger black hole. And that process can go on and on and on and on and on. And eventually you come to the third type of black hole, which is a supermassive black hole. And these... I mean, these guys are actually, they're actually, you know, real monsters. Absolutely, got you know, gigantic black holes, billions and billion times, billions and billions of times the mass of the sun. And um, these are so heavy; these black holes, they have so much mass to them that um, that they actually get dragged towards the center of entire galaxies. So that's sort of why now we've we've done some investigation and some work, and we think that there's the supermassive black holes at the middle of every galaxy and there's certainly one at the the center of the milky way galaxy our galaxy called sagittarius a star so that's our supermassive black hole and um you know that's since been been ob ob indirectly observed and proven so they're the sort of three main types of black hole and then there's a fourth type as well um which is theoretical at the moment but has caused quite a lot of controversy if you like and these are called primordial black holes so these would be black holes that were created in the microseconds after the big bang where there were huge concentrations of energy in particular areas at the time of sort of where neutral hydrogen was forming when if you if you guys have ever seen the cosmic microwave background um, image so this is a, a kind of temperature map of the very very early universe a few seconds after the big bang and in those areas where there are super rich concentrations of the very first elements it's theorized that pr primordial black holes could have been created in those areas and those and those black holes would have been anything from let's say around 100,000 times the mass of the sun maybe to something like, and this was the this was the bit that caused the controversy, to something like one ten thousandth the size of a pinhead. So <laughs> really tiny microscopic black holes, and um, th there was quite a lot of concern, if you like, amongst the non-science community when um, when CERN first opened the Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider was obviously designed to study these elementary particles and the, t the type of conditions that um, were present in the few seconds after the Big Bang. And um, people in the sort of non-science community were sort of rather falsely calling it the, big, uh, the black hole machine which was obviously extremely <laughs> concerning. And there was a sort of huge, um, I suppose, conspiracy theory that, the, that it was possible that the Hadron Collider could have opened up a tiny little black hole and swallowed the entire universe into it by, by, <laughs> by way of quite an exper expensive physics experiment. But that, that wasn't true. And, um, and actually, Elsie and I were talking this week about um, the fact that black holes can't actually be responsible for destroying the entire universe and we had a little bit of a chat about that Elsie and you've done, you've actually been doing some reading on that haven't you so what have you found when you've been reading um so the research I did I kind of concluded that um black holes can't actually expand beyond their event horizon so they can only get so big okay. um they can only um hold so much matter and energy at um a point and there's so much energy and matter in the universe that there's just too much for a black hole to consume at one point i suppose it's, it's like because we always laugh and joke don't we about black holes going around munching things 
at munching things up through the universe. So they go and consume everything in the universe. So I suppose what we're saying is like the, the stomach of a black hole is not big enough to contain all of the matter that's in the universe. Is that, that's kind of what you found? Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah, so I think that's so that's that's a, a great comeback for anyone that thinks that black holes can destroy the entire universe. They're not hungry enough, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but could they destroy? Could they eat our galaxy, like the one in the middle of our um, universe? Not universe, and, and our Milky Way. Could that could that devour the Milky Way, or is there too much matter and mass? No, I think it, it, yeah. No, I think it's certainly possible. I think it's certainly possible for because you you you, you get these enormous. You know that there there is actually another type of black hole over a uh, over a supermassive black hole, which scientists are calling a hypermassive black hole now as well. But I guess this is just as we find these things that get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But but actually, just coming back now to um, to Stephen Hawking's research, he. You know, so, so I suppose he, he did some work on the basis that he thought how you know how big can th- these things get? Could 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 a black hole get big enough to swallow an entire galaxy cluster? And um, <clears throat> and actually, some of his great work was around the discovery of something called Hawking radiation, which was the fact that black holes actually shine a bit, despite them being um, almost infinitely black. And and the reason that they shine is that they're emitting tiny a tiny amount of radiation away from them. So they're losing mass as well as gaining it, if that makes sense. So they gain mass by swallowing objects or merging with one another. But also over time, they radiate that mass away and will eventually evaporate over a long period of time. And I did a little bit of research and I found an amazing number um, and I don't know, I, th- I think I probably heard about this number before. I don't know whether you guys have heard about this number. but um, So I thought, how long does Stephen Hawking think it will take a supermassive black hole to evaporate? And the, the answer to that is 10 to the 100 years. So 10 and 100 zeros after it, which is actually called a Google. No way. <laughs> yeah, that is what that number is called. So, um, yeah, congratulations wow. to the people at Google. Pr- presumably something to do with 10 to the 100 <laughs> search results, only some of which will be relevant to your search, no doubt. But, um, yeah, that's yes. obviously where that number has come from. So, yeah, so that's what he di- That's what he discovered. And um, he also did this um, this excellent work, and it's really good. I think Stephen Hawking was famed for having a bit of a sense of humour over these things. And I, I don't know whether this is somehow slightly humorous that, that – um, that he's put into his into his research, but his last great piece of research was um, the, the the piece that he did with Andrew Strominger, which was about the the soft hair around a black hole. So it was called Black Hole Entropy and Soft Hair. If you want to look the paper up and, and read it, it's quite a compl- complicated paper to read. But I'll try and summarise it to sort of help help you understand what it was. So he was. He was concerned with something that he discovered in the 70s or theorized in the 70s, which was called the information paradox. And this was something that really troubled him. So he thought, if stuff falls into a black hole, we lose it forever. And so once an object falls inside, we can't know anything about that object's future anymore. And that really troubled him, the fact that this, it was almost like a standstill in time. And that that broke so many of the fundamental laws of physics, the information paradox being one of them, um, that it really troubled him. And he thought that this just can't be the case. You know, we've, we must have missed something with this. There's got to be a, um, you know, there's got to be something else. So, and, and, and he th- theorized that actually you can recognize people quite quickly, human beings quite quickly by their hair. So if you were just to see someone's hair, you would be able to recognize that person if you knew them quite quickly. And he said, black holes can't be bald. That was his, uh, <laughs> that, was his, <laughs> that, was his that was his starting point. And then he went through this whole um, research process with some of his team. And he discovered something um, that he called soft hair around the edge of a black hole. And it's actually, uh, it's not actual hair, of course. It's a sort of quantum fluctuation. But what he actually means by that is that when an object falls into the black hole, the Im- that information is not lost. It's recorded on the event horizon. 
And because it's recorded on the event horizon and because black holes aren't truly black, they radiate a little bit, we can measure a black hole's temperature. And actually, um, if you guys or anybody listening is ever um, in London and they want to go and visit the memorial to Stephen Hawking in Westminster Abbey, the formula for calculating the temperature of a black hole is etched onto his memorial. That's what that that's what the equation is that's etched onto the front of his memorial. The um, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. The, it's the the formula to calculate the temperature of a black hole, and what that actually did for us in terms of science perspective so the uh, the mixture between the recording of the information on the event horizon and figuring out that black holes are not truly black they're a black body with temperature it means that temperature can be increased and decreased a bit like when you go to the doctor and you feel poorly the doctor takes your temperature you know you, you need to establish a point where something's either normal getting better um you know, getting worse, getting hotter, getting colder. And it's exactly the same with the black hole. So because if information can be recorded on the event horizon and also a temperature measured, it means a black hole has um, entropy. And an entropic relationship places it on the arrow of time, which means it can't last forever. Interesting. Yeah, so that was his work. And... Uh, yeah, he was clever. Still completely mind boggling, but <laughs> interesting. Further, further, um, further evidence that he was quite a clever guy. He was a little bit, wasn't it? And <laughs> go, if, going back to the, the the program you were talking about about black holes, the mathematics that they were putting on 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 the whiteboards and on the blackboards was just incredible. Oh, it was. Yeah, he'd gone. He'd gone as Elsie and I like to say, full Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> we like that we like that term that, that's just a term for a whiteboard with a lot of equations on it <laughs> but there, are, there, are, there has been some sort of um, so that's i guess like the, from the scientific perspective from black holes that's you know um, a, a very brief summary of the type of stuff that we that we know about black holes but there's um, there's lots of interest isn't there around these from um, from other areas so um, not just sort of physics and astrophysics but also um you know where people are considering what might be beyond the event horizon of a black hole so nobody knows that what what is at the singularity what's a white hole that's another interesting one what is um could could a black hole be a portal to another universe or are we living inside one so that's and that's something else that you've been doing some research on Elsie isn't it that's another thing that I we we chatted a little bit this 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 week and I said to you can you try and find out what people think about black holes being entrances to other universes what did you find when you when you searched for that um I kind of couldn't um find much about it so I kind of did something near to it and I did okay. um, about like wormholes and like how they can and can't be wormholes and okay. I didn't really get a lot of information because it's <laughs> just not one of those things that you hear people ask a lot really um and I kind of um got like in science fiction um wormholes are usually depicted as two black holes um yep. so one end of the wormhole is a black hole and then another is a black hole and um then it actually went on to say that one end's a black hole and one end's a white hole <laughs> um and from this i got so black holes so stuff falls into the black hole goes through the wormhole and come shooting out of the white hole that's basically what it said and it kind of said that this is probably not the case although the mathematics of the universe doesn't say that no it cannot happen um but they are usually depicted as very very dense which would mean that um the moment a single particle of matter enters the black hole it would just collapse on itself Okay. Um, but scientists um, do predict that um, wormholes could become more stable 
if they were formed by a spinning black hole instead. Um, okay. So okay. it's kind of included for that. No, that's a really interesting way of putting it, actually. And I, I think you're right. You know, when we do see <clears throat> wormholes, they are often depicted as two two holes, if you like, in, in a piece of material that connect to disparate locations in space and actually it's, it's good that you bring this up because there's nothing else that i wanted to talk about because wormholes were predicted obviously we've nobody seen a wormhole we don't know if this exists yet but wormholes are predicted and absolutely possible under einstein's theory of general relativity so there are quite a few things that have been proven under general relativity before. And one of the really interesting things, I mean, this is so for anybody that is listening that doesn't quite necessarily know what general relativity is, in a, in, in a brief sentence, it was something that Einstein taught us in 1915. And he told us that the empty space or the seemingly empty space around us isn't nothing, it's something so empty space is made of something and it's made of it's made of space but it's also made of time as well so it's this um you know we call it a manifold actually so you may have heard that uh, you may have heard that term before the space time manifold and it's what everything in the universe kind of hangs in and what we figured with this is that um we should be able to detect this material and there have been a lot of experiments to try and detect the material of space-time. And we kind of know it exists, and I suppose you can imagine it. It's why orbits work. So if you can imagine the Earth as a bowling ball st stood on a, a trampoline or a tight blanket, it would make a depression in that blanket. And another object, another spherical object, rolling in a straight line, would follow the easiest path through the curved surface, which would lead it to spin, if you like, or roll around the bowling ball. And that's effectively what an orbit is. And that and, and the material that we're talking about there is the material of space and time. So it's Einstein's space-time. So his mathematics for general relativity theorised that, along with wormholes and a bunch of other stuff. And in 2015, there was... Um, an experiment called um, the LIGO experiment. So have you guys heard about LIGO before? Do you know what that is? Um, no. No. Heard of it. no, okay. So no one knows about LIGO. Okay, so LIGO is um, it's a, it's a, a gravitational experiment, and it's like the world's most accurate ruler. So what they have is they have... Um, so each, each one of the... If you can imagine, the LIGO detector looks like a sort of an L shape. So you've got three points on the L shape, if you like. And what LIGO does is bounce laser beams out along each axis of the L and then back to the middle again. And um, it keeps kind of bouncing those beams out and back in again, out and back in at the speed of light. And each one of those arms is 4,000 metres long, so four kilometres long. And, um, you know... This moves at the speed of light, and the speed of light is infinite, right? So they should all come back at the same time, shouldn't they? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, however, if you can bend space in the way that we described from the bowling ball scenario with the Earth and things orbiting it, we should be able to create a difference in that space. But we're going to need something really really big to do that and what they actually measured was two um super massive sorry not super massive i think they're probably stellar mass two stellar mass black holes orbiting one another and then merging and as those black holes began orbiting one another they become get closer and closer and closer and they orbit faster and faster and faster until they eventually merge but in the moment before they merge they're orbiting so quickly that they send ripples through the space-time and space-time rings like a bell and in 2015 the LIGO experiment detected one of those mergers so that's an wow. in, in, incredible um, 
it pr probably one of the greatest scientific discoveries um, of our lifetime, really, in terms mm -hmm. of proving something that's so theoretical like that, actually making a direct observation. And I mean, the, the, the differences in um, the return speed of the beams from LIGO are infinitesimally small really really tiny tiny differences but of course it's a difference you know you you have to um we're, we're dealing with things that are moving at the speed of light so the infinite speed nothing can surpass the speed of light only these beams came back and returned at different points and it it wasn't that they were traveling um it wasn't that they were traveling any faster it's that some of them had to travel a little bit further or a little bit less far because the actual mm -hmm. fabric of the space that they were um that they were traveling through had stretched so i mean oh, wow. what what an amazing <clears throat> experiment so going back to elsie's point with the wormholes and things like that general relativity um sets its basis out and says that space time is uh, a thing so empty space isn't nothing it's something and the LIGO experiment and a number of other experiments have proved that that's the case so there's theoretically no reason why um, wormholes couldn't or shouldn't exist mathematically as Elsie correctly said it's most certainly possible made more stable by a spinning black hole um, and I wonder whether in time we can become masters of that how how would you guys feel about some experiments that were going on on that scale you know it is quite feels like quite a dangerous area of research doesn't it trying to manufacture a black hole in order to observe it but these things are a bit strange aren't they yeah we'll do it in the shed we'll go in the shed and knock something together <laughs> that's what we'll do <laughs> it could be a great experiment we might we might need more than a shed we, like, we might have to be quite a big shed um, yeah and they maybe do, so they do lots of um, they do lots of work actually um, on black holes by e experimenting with um, w what the effect of stuff on the that crosses over the event horizon and what it might look like and they do a lot of those experiments in water. So if you can imagine, um, you have a big tank of water and they swirl it round, and as you swirl it round, you get that vortex type shape in the. Um, you can even do it actually by stirring a brew really quickly yeah <laughs> you can make yeah. a make a little black hole in your in your brew just by stir <laughs> just by stirring it really quickly but uh yeah so that's that's how they that's how they look at a lot of these things and i've seen a few documentaries on that actually it's really interesting the way that the they because of course studying um the physics and things of black holes is really not only is it really really difficult because um we don't have any black holes handy actually traveling to a black hole would be incredibly dangerous for us on a number of fronts so um has everybody seen the film interstellar uh, not yep. yet no okay so elsie's seen it martin you haven't seen it you you definitely ought to watch it martin anyone that's listening ought to watch it as well because they they definitely um i think they won a few awards probably for the um for the way that 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 film is set up scientifically. It's, it's actually pretty accurate in terms of the way they depict a black hole. So that'd be quite interesting to, to look at that. But it's also interesting the way that they, um, the way that they deal with the time dilation of a black hole as well, because black holes are so, uh, have so much mass and they warp space time so enormously that actually, if you were to orbit round a black hole a few times and go and study it, by the time you came back to Earth, hundreds of thousands of years would have passed. So you're signing up, really. Even if we could find a way to tomorrow to send, um, you know, astronauts or scientists to a black hole, you know, it would be thousands of generations in the future that found the answers. That's where Elon Musk's AI um, will come into play. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't think humans are going to do that. And not no. certainly not for a long, 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 long time, are they? No, they're not. No, um, and 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 this, you're right. This study of black holes is, is it's a, there's an interesting point. Is it, is it going to become purely theoretical, or is it going to remain purely theoretical, or are we going to find a way to directly observe? So you know, in in astrophysics, when we're doing things with astronomy, we have to we can't experiment. You know, we we have to experiment in different ways, and that that 
and that way that division if you like between astrophysics and other sciences is is purely in observation you know so for example if i want to set up an experiment and say i wonder how it would affect the universe if i heated the sun up by 10 degrees i can't just go and put a giant bunsen burner under the sun and heat it up 10 degrees and observe it so we have to <laughs> you have to theorize these things and you just have to look we're we're we're, we're nothing more than casual observers are we so that that's it, an incredibly difficult thing to think about really um in terms of how the research on black holes is going to move forwards because i i am with you i don't see a time when we're going to be sending um even robot explorers to a black hole to to figure out what goes on i mean the, the physics and stuff around those are so dangerous it's such a violent place that actually um you know i don't think i don't think any of our equipment would survive or be able to um you know be able to send any useful information back to us so it's sure violent. um but i do think i do think that the the interest there is that it it would appear that Anything we do is based on our understanding of the laws of physics and maths. Yep. And what makes it so seductive is that everything breaks down. All our understanding of everything kind of breaks down when we start to look at these things. And that is the ultimate get out of your comfort zone for scientists, isn't it? And I think that if, if there can be more research done in that, that's where I think a lot of the new breakthroughs will, will will come from because if we already understand what's happening now and we can theorize things as soon as it breaks down there's something else happening and that's got to be hopefully more interesting than what's already interesting you know yeah i do yeah elsie how do you see this because you've got you've got this um goal i suppose haven't you your ambition your uh, as it as it stands at the moment your interest in in science and stuff is really concentrated in this area and this is an area that you'd really like to work in so how do you see that how do you think that people might study these things in the future do you think people will go i don't think people will go but what do you think i don't think it's possible to go because most of the black holes that we know about anyway are light years away and we can't travel at the speed of light so it would take us hundreds of and thousands of years to get to it so the only possible way to do it is to build like a robot or some sort of ai to get there because you, a human life wouldn't be able to get to a, to any sort of black hole in time so before mm. a human dies so you would have to kind of do it theoretically if you were to study a black hole would you be would you be happy with just doing it that way would you be happy with so if you if you can imagine fast forwarding 20 years 30 years into the future could you could you imagine that you'd be happy with having a career studying black holes that was just done on a piece of graph paper in a classroom with some casual observation maybe or do you want more than that i would quite like to know what goes in on inside a black hole and if the way to do it is theoretically then that's probably how i would do it but i think to really know what's going on you have to do an experiment to prove it really otherwise yep. it's not there's no way to know whether you're correct or incorrect um i agree so i think it would be good to send something to a black hole and to see if it could survive the intensity of the gravity and just the black hole to see if we could see what is inside the singularity which is very very unlikely and it would not get there um in a human lifespan so we would have so it would take generations for it to get there anyway so yeah, I agree. And I think this is probably where some of the experimentation is coming in. If we can, if we can somehow, um, you know, artificially 
um, manipulate, uh, you know, gravity in it within our space and create what is almost a laboratory black hole. I mean, that's the way that we tend to do these things, isn't it? If you remember the um, <clears throat> really, really famous um, experiment, and I'm sure you guys have all seen it, where if you remove um if you in a, if you create a vacuum and you remove all the air out of a, a particular thing you'll get you can get like a feather and an anvil will fall at the same rate and this was something that was theorized wasn't it by galileo you know thousands of years ago um and um when i can't remember which apollo mission it was apollo 17 maybe something like that 17 or 18 the apollo astronauts um took a feather a falcon feather and it was a geology mission, so I think they had a geology hammer as well, and they dropped both of those things on the surface of the moon together. And for me, I love that. I loved that speech. That was, for me, more poignant and more um, pro- more of a profound speech than Neil Armstrong's One Small Step. And um, the astronaut, and uh, forgive me, I can't, I can't actually remember the uh, the astronaut's name, but he dropped uh, he dropped the falcon feather. Because, you know, how we have, like, the eagle has landed and all that sort of thing. Well, his lunar module was called the Falcon. So he took a, an American Falcon feather with him and dropped it with a, a with a, a geology hammer at the same time. And they hit the surface of the moon together. And his famous line was, Mr. Galileo was right. And that <laughs> is amazing, isn't it, really? But we did that. We did that, first of all, in a laboratory by sucking all of the air out of a, um, a space and making it a vacuum and, and mm. experimenting with that and thinking, actually, yeah, you, do you know what? A, fa- a falcon feather and a hammer should fall at the same rate on the moon. And, it, and then hundreds of years um, after Galileo had first theorised that and tens of years after that experiment had been done in a laboratory, finally someone flew to another part of the solar system and drop two items in a vacuum and they did fall together. So that would be an interesting take, wouldn't it, on the black hole thing? You know, like, is there a way that we can safely create something like this in a laboratory such as the Large Hadron Collider and then learn to study the effects of it in almost microscopic format? I think sometimes we think of these black holes as being, you know, stellar mass black holes or supermassive or hypermassive black holes, these enormous objects in the universe but actually if these um primordial type black holes that we've theorized are a thing if they're re- if it's true that those exist you can get one that is theoretically ten thousand ten thousand times smaller than the head of a pin mm-hmm. so that should be enough shouldn't it for us to to think about and when we think about um when we think about that singularity it's really hard to imagine what that's like as well isn't it is it big is it really tiny? Is it is it thousands and millions of times smaller than a single atom, or is it is it a big object? I think it's a really tiny object. I think that's the way it works. And for me, it was always interesting to think about the uh, when we theorised the Big Bang and what happened at the Big Bang. So the 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 theory is that prior to the Big Bang, there was something that George Lemaitre. Th- called a, a primeval superatom, which is this infinitely small, infinitely dense, infinitely hot, little tiny part of space that contained everything inside it. And that does sound a lot like, doesn't it, what we describe at the centre of a black hole. It does, and, and it's still really difficult to kind of, of understand because the, the way I kind of think about it is that if a black hole is eating matter, it's eating energy, it's, it's, it's eating anything around it, then unless the pressures inside a black hole are, are just so immense that it crushes everything to nothing, then surely if, if things are being squashed, let's say, on top of each other, then the singularity, I would think, may grow. You know, now it may grow at a very slow rate because the pressures are so intense inside, you know, in, inside a black hole. Yeah. But if there's if matter's going in, it's going somewhere, and I, I don't know how it can just disappear unless the forces are so strong that it just, you know, poof, it's gone. 
you know. But if it isn't, I think it. I think it would have to build on top of itself, mm. even though it would be very slow and grow and grow and grow to the point where it can't absorb anything else, and then it evaporates because there's no more space for anything. Then the question is, well, if it evaporates, where does it all go? Yeah, it's a, it's a really it, that that's a really good question, isn't it? And I think we're really bouncing around the theoretical walls, aren't we? Of of this stuff, nobody nobody understands it. So at the minute, I think anything's fair game. That's as good a theory or explanation, I think, as anyone can have um, about what happens at the singularity, whether it gets any bigger. Um, if there is a finite amount of space, as Elsie as Elsie pointed out from her research, you, you can't a black hole can't swallow the entire universe. It's not hungry enough. So that suggests, doesn't it, that there's got to be a finite amount of space inside the black hole if we fed it everything and everything and everything what happens when it's full up yeah exactly because i think we've I, maybe we'll never find out maybe we'll never find that out oh, no, because it's just they're just so massive you know <laughs> if we do find it out we will we'll hopefully be find it out from the outside yeah <laughs> i know I'll, even if we make a small one i won't be sticking my finger in it put it that no way. no i don't think it's the sort of thing that we need to prod it's those bl- <laughs> microscopic black holes and hornet's nests are definitely on that, yeah. <laughs> on, that on that list of things that it's a really poor idea to prod with a stick yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i, I suppose we, we see these things don't we um and just to i guess sort of wind wind this t- wind this topic up to a close we've talked about you know this is where science fact meets science fiction a little bit we see lots of things like wormholes and um you know black holes in science fiction but this is it's rapidly transferring across into science fact now isn't it so with things like the event horizon telescope which um if you don't know what the event horizon telescope is look it up it's a it's a network of radio telescopes that are all linked together all the way across the earth creating a virtual aperture which is the size of the earth itself and that that was what was used to photograph the um the, the very first black hole in the uh, in the netflix documentary that they speak about so that that was um you know that was what they were doing so with that that's a huge science experiment it's taken an actual photograph of a black hole and then the LIGO experiment which is observed directly two black holes orbiting one another and merging creating ripples in space-time making space-time ring like a bell so these things now Mm. they're not science fiction anymore they're now science fact so black holes once were theorized very very famously theorized by relativity um and we went on to prove that those existed um you know the same with the ringing of space time that was proved as well so as these things cross over from science fiction to science fact it becomes um ever more an interesting time to be alive doesn't it and we i I wonder i don't know what you guys think and maybe you could give an opinion but where do we think that the next big thing is coming from in terms of that in terms of that black hole discovery, what would be, what would be your definitive, amazing um, discovery to happen in your lifetime on that? I think for me, it would be the discovery of the wormholes. Even if we could see one and we didn't understand it, but even if we, even if we could say, do you know what? Actually, that was theoretically that was um, it was theorised by relativity. But now we've made a direct observation of a wormhole. We've got no idea where it goes. We've got no idea how it works. But now, not just theoretically, I can, you know, in in actual, in actual, the natural um, state of the universe, I can get from A to B and I don't have to travel faster and faster and faster to cover a large distance i think that's got a really profound implication don't you so what what did take us a hundred thousand years in a straight line actually it's now very possible that we could get there in half a second if we understood the physics that would be yeah, that, that, that would be an amazing discovery for me i mean i think we're thousands of years away from discovering how to manipulate and control that but even if we could prove that that wasn't theoretical anymore it wasn't science fiction; it was science fact. I think that would be incredible. What about you, Elsie? What would you, what would you think? You've got more life left to live than all of us, so it's probably better be a good answer from you. 
<laughs> the thing that I would like to know most is what happens to something when it goes into a black hole. We obviously know it goes into the singularity, but does it stay there until the end of the black hole's life? Does it come out as Hawking radiation? Or does something else happen to it that we don't know? That's the thing that I would like to know in my lifetime. Uh, I, I would like to know that as well without being greedy and wanting to know two things. So I think that would be amazing. What about you, Mark? <laughs> I think I, I'm with you, Ian. I think if, we, if we're talking about maybe we can create something, you know, uh, uh, our own black hole here, you know, in a laboratory, that would be great. The, the next step, if you can't do that, would be to understand space-time and how we can bend that so we can travel large distances in a, in a, in a short amount of time. So that, that, to me, seems like a natural progression of if we can't make one, we've got to figure out a way to get to one, and that seems the, the, the process would be to, to, to bend space-time and, and, and travel the... It would, the yeah, it would. I think, no, I, I agree. I agree. And I think both of those things would be would be amazing discoveries. And they, you know whether it feels likely or not i don't know would we ever would we ever find out what happened to something when it went in a black hole i think it's difficult isn't it i think it's difficult i mean i've watched a lot of um documentaries on this subject seen a lot of um physicists that special theoretical physicists that specialize in this area and um yeah, they, they've got a lot of varying views on on what happens. One one of the things that I think I found the most interesting um, was that if you if you fall into a black hole, you would expect that, wouldn't you, to be a heavily traumatic situation? But actually, physicists suggest that it's actually a really serene experience, and you wouldn't even know that you'd cross the event horizon. Really strange, isn't it? So what That's is really weird? Yeah, yeah. So what is the ultimate? Um, what is the ultimate sort of um, violent place in the universe? Actually, crossing over that event horizon would be a very serene experience. If you could, if you could sort of get beyond some of the other things that they suggest might happen as well. Because if you can imagine the event horizon being like this, <laughs> being like the surface of some water. If you t- if you touched your finger on on it then the little tiny piece of your finger would be accelerated very quickly towards the singularity whilst the rest of you was on the outside. And, and it's one of those amazing scientific names. I love, a, I, I love the fact that when scientists discover something, they've spent so much time and energy and brain power on the actual discovery that they run out of time to give it a scientific name. And that process is called spaghettification. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real thing look it up spaghettification so you get pulled out like a strand of spaghetti when you fall inside that's really strange oh isn't it? and actually from from the outside of the black hole as well if i was to observe you going into it i wouldn't ever see you cross the event horizon you would just look like you'd frozen in time on the edge to me that weird isn't yeah, it that is that is just weird that is <laughs> Because when you see these, and I know that it's all CGI, but you see, you know, a black hole devouring a star, and it's got, you know, the, the the star is some distance away, but there's a trail coming off the star into the black hole, and it's taking all that matter in. Yeah, um, you would then think that when well, you're talking about the plas- the ring of plasma that that's around a black hole, yeah, then it then uh, right on the horizon in that if you think if that theory is correct, it would stop you wouldn't see anything entering. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. So right. You wouldn't actually see it. Yeah, you're right, yeah. So I, I suppose what, 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 we're, what we're basically saying there is that all those visualisations are sort of incorrect, aren't they? They're, they they give some poetic li- a little bit of poetic licence to enable us to understand what the process is. But from a, yes, yes. From a pure physics point of view, yeah, sure, it would, you would stick to the surface, visually anyway, from the mm. outside, whilst being, whilst being internally spaghettified. <laughs> Feels like a yeah. nice feels like a nice place for me to stop um elsie f- <laughs> final, final words from you you are uh, our future black hole astrophysicist what are your what are your parting words on this subject um got to try <laughs> and think now. 
Um, <laughs> We've left a loss for we lost for words. What, what's think, going to be your? Yeah, go on, go on. I think that black holes are one of the. They're one of the things in the universe that we think that we know, like a lot about. Like we know what it is, but we we know surprisingly little like when we compare what we know about a black hole to anything else you will see how little we know i i think that's a bit scary that it a black hole is so powerful in a way and it's the thing that we know surprisingly little about yeah, I <clears throat> I agree. I agree. I think that's a good I think that's a good part in comment as well. There's plenty of work to be done there, and um, you could you could probably contribute towards that quite significantly, especially thinking about it in that kind of lateral sense that you have done there as well. I think that's really good. Mark, how about you? Parting words on this subject. Uh, yeah, um, my my brain's completely fried and disappeared now. <laughs> um, so uh, my parting words will be. I think I'll need to have a beer or two. <laughs> As will we all, but not Elsie. Just water for Elsie, I think. At this just point. water for Elsie. Just water for Elsie, <laughs> just to be clear with everyone there. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's been another. It's been another great chat. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I feel like we've feel like we've kicked this subject around for um, you know about an hour. We've we've covered um, the different types of black holes. We've covered everybody's opinion, what everybody thinks, what we think that we know about black holes. So. Um, I think we'll probably follow it up with um, a blog ple- a blog piece. Um, I'll summarise some of this information in a blog for everyone to read. Put a bunch of links at the bottom of that to some of this stuff that we've been talking about, like LIGO, the Event Horizon Telescope, spaghettification, which I love. I might, that feels like a blog post all by itself. I, I love that. Um, and, I'm um, hungry, no. <laughs> hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, actually. I could, I could really eat spaghetti. What about you, Elsie? Yeah. <laughs> Spaghetti all round, I think. Um, yeah. So th- thanks everyone for uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and listening to our black hole ramblings. Uh, we'll be back with episode three, uh, which we'll be doing in a couple of weeks' time, and the subject for uh, episode three is infinity. So what? A, what, a, what, an in, what an interesting discussion that's going to be. Is it big, or is it small? Is it fast, or is it slow, or is it all four? So yeah, we'll find out some homework. <laughs> so thanks everyone for listening. Thanks Elsie so much for joining us. Thanks Mark as usual, and we'll see you all on the next one. The TAS Podcast with Ian Hall and Martin Bradley. Find us on Spotify and YouTube. Subscribe for science discussion, expert analysis, and opinion. Visit our website, theaveragescientist.co.uk, for articles and explainers, or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok for regular content and updates. The Average Scientist, making science accessible for everyone.